My name is Robin Clark. I'm from OPM. I'll be chairing the session. Um, so this is the planned surgical care one. Um, it's the same drill as this morning in that there are four components, if you like, to the session. After I finish speaking, um, we'll have a presentation for about 20 to 25 minutes or so. Five minutes or so then for um, questions and answers. And those Q&A should be around clarifying what's presented, whether it's the principles um, that underpin the model that's been talked about, or the actual example um, uh, or the case study that's going to be presented to you. Um, it's then going to be over to you guys to work at tables, and I'm going to suggest if the numbers don't increase, we might go down to two tables, if that's okay. I think it probably makes sense. And then we will do a brief bit of feedback. I'll try and draw some conclusions together. Hopefully you will agree with my reading of the discussions. Um, and then that's it. Uh, so we conclude at 2.30. 2.30 to 2.45 will be a coffee break, then we're back in here for the final session of the afternoon. All sound good? Excellent. OK, I'm going to hand over to James from Boston Consulting Group, who's going to introduce the session. Then it'll be Detlev and then Graham. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. I just have the first, first slide. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, so our proposal here is that planned surgical care should be delivered with higher volumes in fewer centres as a way of driving better outcomes and lower costs. So that's our proposal. And the reason we picked it is because we think it's tractable. So we think it's tractable because... It is, there is a large amount of evidence base. There's good principles underlying it. There's an evidence base. It's 10 to 15 billion of spend, and we think that it's tractable in the short term. And we'll talk you through, talk you through why that is. I'm going to spend just five minutes just talking through the setup and some of the principles, and then I'm going to hand over to uh, Detlev Lopo. Now, Detlev is the chief executive of the Martini Clinic, which is one of the world's leading prostate cancer clinics. So we'll focus as we go through on prostate cancer but I think he gives a very good example of best practice and certainly the direction of travel that we think the providers in the UK should be heading to. And then after that, I'll hand to Graham Rich, who will then talk about, okay, how do we get this to happen? So if the evidence bases are clear, if we've actually got really good best practices, why the hell aren't we moving? So we'll then talk to sort of some of the barriers, but also how to overcome those. And some of those are quite short-term and actionable. So three principles underlie this. The first is accumulated experience. So we talk a lot about scale in the NHS, but actually we believe the most important thing is actually accumulated experience. So the experience curve is a known phenomenon that essentially says every time you double the volume of something, you double the experience of something, you improve by a set amount. And in healthcare, we've looked at the improvement in outcomes that prostate surgeons get, and every time they double the volume, they, that in that additional volume, they improve by about 15%. And so that's the experience curve. It works in healthcare. It works in other services. It works in sports. It works in music. It works in industries. And it's intuitive. It's intuitive. You know, most of us know that if we practice, we get better. And it's also intuitive to patients, because patients also, when they're looking for surgeons, actually will want to know how many, sur how many operations or procedures that person does. So at the core of this is an intuitive concept of accumulated experience. But for accumulated experience to drive improvement, you've got to have clarity of what you're trying to achieve. And like many of the reforms around the world, we'd say you've got to focus on outcomes, but importantly focus on the outcomes that matter to patients. And you know, that's the basis of value-based healthcare, it's the basis of accountable care, it's the basis of some of the integrated care. And so and as we talk a little bit around prostate, we'll hear that actually what really matters to patients is around incontinence and impotence and erectile dysfunction. And that's what, really, that's what really, really matters. So we'll talk a bit about what matters on patients. And the third thing is, the third piece of the concept is no good having just those two. You also need to be transparent. And if you, put, if you put the data around outcomes and volumes into the public domain, you see marked improvement. We've seen it around the world in other places. We've seen it in the UK with cardiothoracic. We've seen it in Sweden. And so those are the three underlying principles. The reviews, there are many, many reports on, that look at volume and quality. I think 
One of the best reviews is actually by Chowdhury in 2007, looked at 163 different studies as a meta review. 93% of those show an improvement in quality as you increase volume. What this chart shows is just two examples of the sort of things you see. So on the left here is some work in the US on prostatectomies that will fit in the, in the flow of today. And as, you dr as the number of prostatectomies per surgeon rises, essentially the percentage of incomplete resection falls down. So it's a measure of quality. So that's at the surgeon level. The one on the, the, the right we put up, because it's, it's a similar thing around breast cancer, but it's looking at hospitals rather than individual surgeons. So it's looking at teams. And the same thing applies. As you put higher volumes through, you get better results. It also works if you reconfigure. So stroke in London is an example of reconfiguring uh, that's probably well known. This one comes from Denmark. So this is a reduction in the number of centres that are looking at that are doing colorectal surgery. And over the, te the decade that they basically reconfigured and went down to about a third of the number, the outcomes, in this, in this case, measured as post-operative mortality and falls to less than half of what it was at the beginning. Many factors involved, but the concentration is part of it. So we're going to talk about prostate cancer and prostate surgery. So I thought it'd be helpful just to get a little background of where we are in the UK. So in the UK, 90 trusts uh, perform some prostatectomies. In, this is the 11-12 data. The largest of those is North Bristol. Graham will talk a bit about that, just over 300. But you can also see almost 40% of, uh, of trusts are performing less than 50. Now, what this chart shows, it shows the dark green is prostatectomy. We've also put cystectomy on there because the actual guidelines from the commissioning board, uh, the team needs to be doing, if both of those operations should be doing at least 50. So at least one a week. As you can see, 40% of the trusts don't do that. Um, we also... We also then said, okay, so part of this is accumulated experience. Part of this is outcomes. There is no clinical audit that looks at the outcomes that matter for patients in prostate. The British Association of Urological Surgeons does an audit, which is voluntary. About a third of these operations are in that audit. And it looks at the, what matters to the clinicians and the surgeons. So it looks, at the, it looks at bleed rates and it looks at sort of surgical procedure rates. It doesn't measure continence and it doesn't measure erectile, erectile dysfunction afterwards. We also thought, what about transparency? So we took the top 10 of these and looked in the quality accounts. Not a single one of the top 10 of these providers put anything about prostate cancer outcomes in their quality accounts. So we've got some way, some way to go. The resistance we hear when we say move to lower centres, though, is obviously about access. And so we did one other thing. So this is on the left-hand side here. Here's the 92 centres that currently perform some sort of prostatectomy. And look at the middle one here. So at the moment, 92% of the population are within 45 minutes. We said, well, what happens if we went to the sites really that are doing 100, 100 or more? So it's about 33 sites. It drops from 92 to 88. So it's not as marked an impact as you, could, as you think. And we then said, what about creating half that again to see what happens? It, that's, that's getting there, but there's still, in a second, when we talk to the Martini Clinic, you'll see something different. So that's a little bit of the setup of the logic and where we are in the UK. I'm now going to hand over to Detlev, and as Detlev talks through the Martini Clinic story, listen for, listen for volumes, listen for outcomes focus, listen for the transparency, and listen about travel times, and that will give a sharp contrast to the UK. Detlev. Thank you, James. Oop, that's the wrong button. So in the next few minutes, I will tell you the story of the Martini Clinic. Martini Clinic was founded in 2004 by the University Hospital Hamburg-Eppendorf, which is, uh, has the abbreviation UKE. In some slides, it will occur. And the Martini Clinic is the only European institution dedicated exclusively for prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment. We offer every therapy. We offer open and robotic surgery. We open drug and radiation therapy and active surveillance. Instead of having a typical hierarchical structure, in the Martini Clinic, we have a faculty system. 
that means that 10 equally ranked consultants are paid as a, compared to a chief of service in other institutions to re retrain the talent in the Martini Clinic. Nine of these 10 faculty members perform or train all open and robotic surgeries. So there's no one else than them doing the surgery. And as a lifetime, as a faculty position is a lifetime position, experience accumulates in the Martini Clinic. Let's go back nine years. Nine years ago, uh, the university hospital has a deficit of 35 million euro. So they had to solve the problem. Therefore, we conducted a full portfolio review of all of clinical services and made some market and portfolio analysis. And we changed from we do everything as a university hospital to what we, we know who's best and what we do, we do better than others. In Hamburg, we have 35 hospitals and it's a very competitive surrounding. As an example, we merged orthopedics and trauma department. We redesigned some processes in the general surgery department. And we defined a growth strategy for the urology department, which finally led to the foundation of the Martini Clinic. In 2012, more than 5,000 patients visited our outpatient clinics. And approximately 2,200 underwent radical prostatectomy in the Martini Clinic. The scientific output from April 2005 until at the end of 2012 was 177 original article and 26 review article, and we received funding of 17.5 million euro uh, for research and in industrial funds since 2008. But all these Prostate cancer treatment and research is of no use without any follow-up data. Therefore, since 1992, we have collected every data in our Martini Clinic database. We collected epidemi epidemiological data, clinical data, as well as data from this um, histological um, analysis of uh, biopsies, frozen section analysis, and the whole radical specimen. <clears throat> and more than this, we collected follow-up data. That means it's very important that if you um, focus on follow-up data, that you use data that matters to the patient and for prostatectomy, it is mainly the virility and the continence rate which is important for the patient. If you can choose a clinic where you have a 50% chance to be continent afterwards, or if you have one where you can be sure that 98%, uh, in 98% you can be continent afterwards, it's your choice to throw the coin or to choose the right hospital. In our hospital, six employees are exclusively working in this um, outcome study group, spreading and retrieving 15 to 18,000 questionnaires every year. And 20 years of gathering outcomes data in combination with our high volume surgeons helped us to make some game-changing progress and to strengthen the offering of the Martini Clinic. I tell you a short story. Every six months, our surgeons, our nine surgeons, sit together and discuss their results in order to improve their own quality 
and to share best practice. And once, one very young surgeon had a 20% better early continence rate than all the experienced ones. So first everybody said, yes, you, young guy, you receive just the, the, the easy patients and so, but as it was not true, the senior consultant joined as an assistant, the young one, just to identify the difference, which finally occurred to be a, pres um, a preservation of a, a longer part of the urethral sphincter, which is uh, the muscle who is responsible for the continence. It takes half an hour more operation time, but it delivers a lot more quality of life for the patient. Every surgeon adapted the method, and the early continence rate, seven days after surgery, reached 90% in every surgeon. All our efforts finally led to a huge growth of patient volume over the, year, over the years. We've reached a level of 2,200 radical prostatectomies for the last three years. And made us to the number one academic prostate cancer center worldwide performing nearly 1,000 radical prostatectomies more than the Mayo Clinic in 2011. And our approach resulted in excellent outcomes compared to the average of the hospitals in Germany. This data is published by a German healthcare insurance company, and um, the gray bars are the average of all the Barmer insured patients all over Germany. The blue ones are the Martini Clinic data, also only of this um, Barmer insured patients. And you see we have much lower rates of erectile dysfunction, incontinence, and post-operative complications. We published our data on our, on our website, and our patients traveling more than 300 kilometers increased from 10% in 2005 to 26% this year. So patients travel for better quality. I'm sorry, it, it just, I grew up with the metric system, so it's about the distance from London to Manchester. <laughs> okay, just to, to summarize. We have some individual experience. This is a learning curve of a surgeon, and it's necessary to perform, let's say, 400 radical prostatectomies to reach a certain level, this is a confidence interval, of quality in terms of five-year um, um, prostate uh, PSA free recurrence um, after surgery. On top, we have an um, an institutional experience. If a surgeon begins later on in a high volume center, which is very experienced, he starts on a much higher level concerning the, the continence rates in patients than the others who started earlier. So it's very important to have high volumes to reach better results and to achieve better learning curves for young surgeons. What's also important for us is the is networks. Usually, the decision which therapy is the best for the patient is made while the patient and his partner, wife or partner, is present, and the referring local urologist joins the decision-making process by telephone. He's integrated in the, in the process. And what's also important is that we try to 
send, uh, try to report the results as soon as possible to the patient, but also to the referring urologist. He must be connected as close as possible to the hospital. For us, it's important that we can rely on our university clinical background. If we need an ICU, we have one. If we need a cardiac specialist, we have one. Yeah, it's just two minutes walk and we get the best support we can imagine. So 20 years of experience and complete data in our Martini Clinic database enabled us to develop some game-changing process. And subsequently, our healing rates and, and complication rates are superior to others. Our individual care approach, one patient is treated by one surgeon from the first outpatient visit, surgery, and for uh, the uh, last talk when he leaves the clinic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just um, it's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very important for us. And we have a nursing team which um, um, tries to, to, to make the stay as comfortable as possible. Our aim is that the patient, if he receives the questionnaire one year later, remembers his stay as a good experience. And I think the numbers of patients show that. I'll just give up to Graham. Thank you very much, Lev. And a fantastic case study and very compelling. I first heard it about 18 months ago, and I think if I ever have prostate cancer, I know where I'm traveling, just looking at those outcomes. Uh, and I will be part of your 1% or 2% that go internationally to seek treatment. Uh, thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure working with you in terms of developing this thinking. So given the scale of the international evidence, given it covers so many parts of planned surgical care, you would think that we would be a long way down the track by now, us all being rational, logical players, having lots of uh, intelligent commissioners and thoughtful people doing the numbers, uh, but we're a long way from that. In developing this thinking, we've talked to directors of strategy, we've talked to urologists, we've talked to patient groups, uh, we've talked to commissioners, and we've heard some different things. So we've heard for commissioners that actually what they're often buying, they're not quite sure on the quality. It's not in the public domain, it's not that easily accessible. They often need expert advice to be able to interpret what is there. It's often hidden away in professional registries. It's not very easy to use, and it's not very easy to persuade the public that this is something that could be, uh, give greater quality at lower cost uh, with a better patient experience. For hospitals, we heard that uh, some of the hospitals now are currently quite worried about the application of competition law, even worried about having partnership discussions with neighboring trusts in terms of service configurations, feel quite paralyzed by that. Um, so they're worried about that. Uh, some trusts would quite like to give up services, but they're bound to legally under their terms of authorization uh, to provide all the services that they are required to do so by local commissioners. So they need both permission from the local commissioner and from monitor to change their terms of authorization in terms of the services. And if you are a relatively small hospital, Actually, yes, a few prostatectomies might return you a fair bit of surplus that you don't want to lose. Uh, so there's quite a bit of things there on the table for hospitals. For health system leaders, reconfiguration can be a once-in-a-lifetime, painful, expensive, complicated process. So I was, uh, came in at the tail end of the prostate reconfiguration in Bristol. I was the CEO of the hospital that... Uh, moved our team to the neighboring hospital to produce the biggest prostate cancer center in the UK. And the discussions had been going on probably five years before I'd arrived in Bristol, and it still took us another two and a half years to complete it. And millions had been spent on public consultation. Uh, lots of people had tried to stop it. Uh, and we've achieved that now. Actually, the environment now is actually even more difficult than at that point, potentially for system leaders that are trying to change things. Clinicians like to be co-located. 
Uh, they like the safety and the feeling of being with other specialists that can rush in and save people or work with complex patients. So they often, if they say, you take this piece away, this piece will then not work. We can't do this, and you have a pack of cards which then fall. And as we've heard in other sessions, the public are deeply loyal to local services. They, they like to see the symbol of the NHS locally thriving well. They like to, to go to what they know. And politicians just follow that. So often, health service managers get frustrated and say it's all politicians. They're just representing the public view. And without transparency on quality, actually the counter-argument is very difficult to be put. But it's not all doom and gloom. As one of, the, uh, one of the things James said is one of the reasons we wanted to focus on this area is actually there's tons that can be done and things that can be changed now in order to be able to unlock a big chunk of what goes on in hospitals and unlock the whole reconfiguration process which is currently uh, in stuck in quite a number of places around the country. So, first off, systematically collect and publish outcomes data. And I know uh, Bruce and his team has been uh, driving this forward over the last few years, pioneering it in cardiothoracic surgery, etc. but it's not widely adopted across specialties. The work is being done at the moment internationally. Uh, the, the Boston Consulting Group is part of a non-profit collaboration based in Boston with the Karolinska Institute and Harvard Business School. And just today, I think their time difference suggests it'll probably be in a couple of hours' time, they're publishing 12 internationally agreed measures for prostate cancer, which have been developed by 50 people from nine different countries, including the UK and from the Martini Clinic. And those Outcome measures are there, available, including the risk adjustment measures that are required. People can just adopt them, start using them, publish them. So it's an, it, some of those facilitating pieces are there. So when we spoke to people in the British Association of Urological Surgeons, they said, yeah, we sort of know roughly-ish what we want to do. It's all very difficult to measure. We're thinking about starting a, a working group on it. It's on our list of things to do. We know we should be doing it, um, but clearly, you know, a lot of that preparatory work has been done. I think as national leaders, national leaders can signal the direction of travel strongly, repeat it, talk about the evidence, lead the debate, and that can be both professional associations and NHS England and other national bodies. Uh, that would be very helpful, and it would be helpful for the NHS to be able to see that this is going to happen and that when people are convinced something's going to happen, strangely things happen in the NHS quite quickly. It's the period when they don't think anything's going to happen is extended forever, but as soon as you get to the tipping point and people say, we're going to have to do it anyway, things change really quickly. Uh, under three here, we've got a really, really tiny definition of a market and a locality at the moment, partly uh, e even more focused by brand new uh, clinical commissioning groups who are focused on the local area, but also it's enshrined in OFT and uh, competition cooperation directorate decisions on what constitutes a market. And the market, as defined, uh, the lawyers use, is the current market, the current referral pathway, the current geography. Clearly that puts a block on expanding your scope and understanding and thinking through how you could organise across many more different sites. So there's, there's something about enabling, giving trust confidence to talk about configuration, encouraging networks of surgeons to do this, and other team members, not just the, the, the medics, as we heard from Detlevy. This is a multidisciplinary affair with lots of different professionals required to provide the best services. And on five, uh, trusts who are uh, providing low-quality service that is um, uh, low profitability, unsafe, with huge complication rates, they should be able to just stop doing stuff easily without permission, provided there's an, a suitable alternative provider within a reasonable access distance. It shouldn't require some massive planning process to be able to do that. The other piece, I think, here is that having run a huge organisation myself, a big teaching hospital, I know that big organisations often stifle innovation 
And one interesting factor here that we heard from the Martini Clinic is the big teaching hospital spun it out and said, okay, you're a group of people that you want to do something really well, you want to focus, you will be in part of an independent organization, we will benefit from the surplus you generate, but you go and do it. And they've created a subculture that is driving quality improvement much faster than probably in the main parent hospital. Uh, they're producing a bigger surplus than they ever did for the teaching hospital, and they're encouraging uh, and attracting patients from all across Germany and across the world. So this is a story of prostate. Uh, these are some of the barriers and enablers we think can unlock it for the UK. It's much broader than that, as we heard this morning, specialist commissioning uh, and other types of services that are amenable for this is a huge proportion of the NHS budget, 10 to 15 billion, if not more, and are often the jigsaw puzzle piece that we can use, to, it's the wrong metaphor, but we can unlock a lot of the health systems that are currently frozen in a pattern of unsustainable, low quality, low volume services that are not providing what patients need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thanks very much. Um, before we go into the table discussions, are there any questions? And these might be issues of clarification around the principles that underpin the model, or it might be clarification about some of the things that Detlef was saying about the Martini Clinic. Let's say we had in Hamburg a political situation where it was able to spin out a new company. This is at the moment not possible because the politics doesn't want to do it. So we had the chance to do it, but the business developed so quickly and so successfully that we have a high degrees of liberty and we really uh, run our own as long as the result is uh, as good as it is. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Gentleman at the back. But I just wonder if you say a bit more about how you keep people in, in this into an isolated specialty, your comments about the connectivity with other clinicians being part of a, a big institution. Uh, I, yeah. yeah, thanks. Uh, well, you should tell yeah. you what so you've done for the hospital. We have the university hospital still has a huge department for urology, but when um, the, the former senior leader of this unit left, to lead the Martini Clinic. The following leader for the urology, urology department was, um, the, the, the search was completely um, described without prostate cancer. So and there's a very good and close collaboration because all the um, assistant uh, doctors and all the um, the urologists rotate to the Martini Clinic to get their um, education in prostate cancer treatment. So it's a close relationship on the one hand for educational purposes, but on the other hand, the uh, economics point of view, it's completely free. I, I guess you, also part of your question is how do you keep the surgeons there doing the same sort of thing every day? One of the worries that clinicians have and other people have in the UK is that people you know, get bored, they, you yeah. can't attract people. How have, you, the, how have you managed it, that? It's very important um, that uh, all these surgeons are crazy about prostate cancer. <laughs> they live and they die for it. Yeah? And you have to, 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 to look until you find somebody who fits to this team. And as these um, um, urologists rotate from the university hospital to the Martini Clinic, we have time. We see them three times. Usually we see them in a, in a preclinical uh, phase. We see them as an assistant, and we see them as an urologist. So we, we know soft skills. We know their, their uh, ability to, to be a good surgeon. 
And then we can choose if we have enough caseload, we can add another member to the faculty. Okay. Any final, just you want to one final question, then we'll go into discussions. I, I just wanted to clarify the um, you, you said that the, the surgeons that you um, that you hire are ones that are really passionate about this this part of the work, this specific thing. Um, w would that also have some sort of impact on the on the sorts of rates uh, and the quality that you deliver, based on the fact that that you just almost manage to cherry pick the ones that are more passionate about it than anybody else? I think it's a, it's a general rule. If you're interested in a thing, you're good. In that what you're doing there. So um, I, I, last week I met a radiologist who is a crazy about prostate cancer MRT. So um, yeah, it's, you just have to find the ones who fit together and can then produce better results for the patients. Yeah. I mean, the other thing which is on your uh, slide is that you pay them as if they're already ahead of service in another hospital. So there's no financial incentive to leave. And actually, one reason to build the Martini Clinic was also that the, 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 we, we, tried, we, we started measuring quality in 1992. So, and we see we, somebody was in the learning curve, was good, and left the university hospital. So quality dropped. Again, somebody reached a certain level, he left the hospital, and quality dropped. So this was also a reason to build a structure where you're able to, to, to uh, retain these talents. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. That was great.